ಹಾರ There, I hit the button. We're off to the races. So we're sitting here with uh, Martin with a Y. And <laughs> Martin Jenkins from all the way from <laughs> Brisbane, Australia, because he's been his busy soldering. 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 And we also have Tom Jacobs here. And this is another edition. So uh, you guys have to remember that uh, this is completely unedited. So you have to be careful what, uh, you know, you can say whatever you want, but then remember that it's never going to be edited out. So edited, edited, uh, I hate okay. that. I, I find that <laughs> word very hard to say. Edited, edited, edited out. <laughs> I'm gonna edited, it out. <laughs> edited it out. Okay. So Martin, so, okay. The re so we talked, uh, the last show we talked, uh, the last was happening show. We talked to Peter Borchert and found out what's happening in uh, Great Britain. So we thought we'd go. How far is it from Great Britain to Australia, I wonder? Well, flying from Great Britain to Australia, they do a direct flight from Perth to London, and it's 19 hours straight on the plane. Oh, um, if macro. you If you travel the normal route via either Singapore or Dubai, you're looking at about 26 to 28 hours in, a, uh, in transit. So they stop if you do... Uh, would you say Singapore or Dubai? Yeah, well, you'd probably fly from, say, um, Australia to Singapore and then go Singapore to Dubai and then Dubai to um, oh. London or Frankfurt or somewhere like that in Europe. So it's three legs or that that way? Yep. Yep. Okay. Or you can, or they have some, Qantas has some planes and other airlines have some planes that go the straight 19 hours. Yep. They're with the new... Um, Dreamliner that they brought out that goes straight from uh, Perth at 19 hours, and that would be one endurance test to sit in economy class for 19 hours. Oh, holy macro! <laughs> I can't even imagine what that would be like. <laughs> holy yump and yiminy. Those Dreamliners are huge, too. When you see the videos of them landing or taking off, those things are just absolutely massive. Yeah, well, I mean, they're, they're all massive. Every time I go to the airport, I wonder how these things are going to get in the air and stay up there for 16 hours. I know, eh? I mean, like, even, like, I consider myself, I hated flying at first. I was just a complete basket case at flying. It made no sense to me. And then uh, once I got my place in Florida and I go back and forth all the time, I actually quite enjoy it. But even a 737, the thing is huge. It weighs 18, yep. it, I, you know, I think they weigh 18 bazillion tons. And I and I always hate it when the when the stewardess will go, stewardess, flight attendant. Uh, <laughs> I always hate it when the flight attendant will go, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have this flight is completely full. If anybody has any baggage, their the carry ons that they'll put in baggage. And I'm thinking, man, I hope they don't go over on this puppy. And they're going down the runway, and you're thinking, come on, come on, get some thrust here, let's go. <laughs> and you're watching those engines wobble on the wing. Yeah, and those engines are bouncing as long as they go down the <laughs> runway. Jesus, Murphy. It's First just... time I ever flew, ever on a plane in my life, was uh, when I flew from from New York to Paris. So you know, if you're if you're gonna get over your fear of flying, that's the way to do it because you're on the plane for eight hours, no ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah. And you're not getting yep. off. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always like about every time we, uh, we've we been in the States, we fly southwest. Some of those um, uh, people on there, they have such a, f a funny routine for the safety announcement. And I remember one guy was saying, we've got a smoking department. It's on the right and left wing. If you can light them, you can smoke them. <laughs> Yeah, Southwest. So you mean when you once you get because Southwest doesn't go to Australia. No, no. So once you land, no. once you get to LA or wherever, then you start taking Southwest around the country. Yeah, usually when I book our, uh, our little uh, trips to the states, um, which Kevin describes as epic, 
Uh, I usually, we usually just try and get there with Qantas or Virgin Australia and then um, usually pick up Southwest flights because they're, they're nice and cheap. And, um, and uh, being as Mary, my wife, she's uh, in a wheel, well, she used in a wheelchair at the airport. So we get to board the plane first. So yeah. we're usually in the first row. Oh, you usually sit in the first row. So is that is it uh, rush seating on Southwest? Like, is there a good chance I'll get trampled to death in the aisle? Oh, no, I think you'll be looked after. All right. Here's right. But it, it's first come, first serve seating, so. Yeah, I don't get that. I don't understand. I'm Canadian. We don't do that in Canada. Just tell it's them you know Tracy. quite interesting, actually. Go ahead, Tom. I said, just tell them you know Tracy and you're set. Yeah. yeah. Tracy, the official flight attendant of the AML Network. Now, here's my plan, actually, because nobody has ever flown with Tracy. When this is all over, I'm going to I'm going to somehow figure out how to get a hold of one of her friends and then uh, find out where she's get her schedule, maybe two or three weeks out. And then I'm just going to show up on on one of these planes <laughs> unannounced. I'm not going to I'm just going to show up, you know, like Kansas City to Denver or something, you know, and, and MCI to D- DEN. I'm going to, I'm just going to like walk on and go, Oh, Hey, how you doing? And mm-hmm. just, just see what happens from there. Uh, ma- enough, make it nothing. could be another, it, it could be another event where all the AML crew just find out what uh, flight yeah. Tracy's on and, and a dozen of you get on there. Yeah, that'd be, yeah. But then it'd be required. Yeah. The problem with that Martin is Martin. You- what a- Think about it. Think well, about think about me. Think about the problem. You'd have a dozen people, and the problem with that is, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to organize it. It'd be organization no, and yeah, and no, no. Before you even before the thought even crosses your mind, Lionel, don't look at me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're talking organization. We're talking some people. Oh yeah, I'll go. Then they'll back out, and it's like, no, I. You know what? I'll just go and 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 I'll be annoying enough for twelve people. How about that? <laughs> You'll make up, you reckon? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What, what what would be funny is if if like you figured out like, um, like what like she does like three legs in a day or whatever. I think she said on uh, on her uh, her what's happening episode. So it would be funny if you could find out the schedule and have a different person. On every leg, right? Each so leg, yeah. Have you, have Bruce, have Spoon, just have like every every time she boards a new plane, there's an AML person on it. Yeah. That'd there's be another great. AML shirt looking at you. Yeah, right? there you go. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, are you coughing or something, Tom? You keep turning off your mic. Uh, no, I'm uh, eating a uh, peanut butter egg. A peanut butter egg? Ah, yeah. Cadbury's? Uh, no, Reese's. Oh, okay. They're mighty fine eating. Yep. And they're made locally. Ah, okay. Um, all right, uh, Martin, let's get down to brass tacks here. Uh, so uh, this will probably be uh, – I got a question for the three of you guys. I haven't asked you guys yet. I seem to be able to do like one or two of these a day because I don't have a whole lot of anything else to do. And <laughs> and and so long as I don't try to edit them, that it's not a huge job. But there seems to be a lot of people seem to be enjoying or appreciating the extra effort. So I'm going to try to keep going here for a little while doing this. So now they're starting to back up. Like Martin, this probably won't be uh, aired until about a week after we do it because it's always last week on the AML Network. That's right. Uh, so I got a question for you guys. I'm thinking, all right, I'll probably end up with a backlog of these. And when it's over and when I want to stop doing something every day, or I just run out of gas, which is a possibility too, uh, I'll have these left over. Or will they still be, will they still be listenable a month or two months after the big event? Oh, I think they would be because, I mean, you listen to some of the podcasts you've done over the past three, four years. I mean, even the first ones are quite relevant today. All right. Okay. So I guess there's no sell by date on the podcast. No. All right. No. All right. Cool. All right, Martin. So you live in uh, Brisbane, Australia. Yep. Just south of Brisbane. Oh, now your microphone's making a background noise when you're talking. What did you do to it? It was perfect. What? 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 How's that? Yeah. There. You made an. You changed it. Um, I turned I turned my head to look at what the dog was doing because he was making some noises on the floor here. So uh, sorry about that. All right. Uh, 
Yeah, there's no looking at the dog when you do an AML podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's some of the see that stuff would be edited out normally, but nope. <laughs> it's not, just not on this one. No. Nope. So okay, you live in Brisbane, Australia, which is part of the Gold Coast. And uh you're it's right in the middle of COVID nineteen. So how's everybody in Australia? What's happening? What's oh yeah? Because what's your norm? What is your normal job with the? Uh, your what province? What do they call them? Provinces or states? States, states. So you've got the New South Wales, uh, Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, the Northern Territory, Queensland, and you can't forget them. A little island off the southern coast called Tasmania. So what what state are you in? We're in Queensland, and so we're uh, on the east coast, right up on the sort of right and slap bang in the middle of the country on the coast. Did you guys hear me coughing there? Yes, we did. Yeah, that won't be edited out no, either. That, that won't be edited out either. I did. <laughs> I did push the mic away and, co- and cover my hand over it, so hopefully it wasn't too bad. Um, okay, so you're in Queensland, right in the middle of the the west, uh, what, eastern side of Australia. Yes, yep. And so what's On the, the po- east coast. What's the population there? Population in Australia is around about 23 million. And, and uh, you've got to remember uh, Queensland is five times the size of Texas, and we've got a population of 5 million in uh, Queensland. So you're a bit spread out. Uh, just a little. Most of us are all down in the southeast corner, which is where Brisbane, the Gold Coast, and the Sunshine Coast are located. And... Um, there's a smattering of people in uh, on the uh, in Townsville, Cairns, up on the north coast, but very, very little people living inland. All right, yeah, because it kind of gets desolate as you move in. Yeah, the only things that are out there are all the mines, the coal mines, iron ore mines, gold mines. So anybody up there is usually working in the mining industry. All right. So so okay. So. What's uh what's happening right now in Brisbane? Like what's uh what, what's your job? Your regular job? You do something to do with? You're in the government, and you do something to do with? You're an electrical inspector or something? Yes, I'm an electrical inspector with the electrical safety office. So usually, if there's a house fire or a fatality or um, somebody's had some electrical work done and it's not right, or uh, I'm chasing people who are doing electrical work that aren't licensed. Um, yeah, all that fun sort of stuff. But you're not doing that. So they've taken you off of that job and put you on a different job. Yeah, they're giving us other tasks to do in, in between, which uh, now is chasing up um, what they call contact tracing, which is uh, basically following a script that they've given you and entering data into a computer and ringing people that are uh, uh, in self-isolation or meant to be in self-isolation and um, having a conversation and finding out where they've been for the last couple of weeks and who they've spoken to and and then putting that into the database, so which then somebody else actions and traces those people down and tells them to go and get tested or maybe puts them into self-isolation as well. So I guess has that been pretty interesting? It has uh, with a couple of people, but um, as you could imagine, it, it, it is a bit of a drawn out thing because people want to have a conversation. They just want to have a chat. They've been locked in their house <laughs> for, you know, the last five days and they've only been able to speak to their wife. So I've had a couple of uh, a couple of blokes that have been a bit stir crazy. <laughs> and they just want to talk, talk, talk. So any, exactly. Any interesting stories that kind of stick out, or you're not allowed to say, or oh, I'm not really allowed to say uh, anything. But um, basically, no, they're, they're basically people that have come back a holiday, had a great holiday until probably about the last week. A few of them have been off cruise ships, um, which is a, a bit sad because the poor old cruise industry is copping a hiding at the moment, and. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, they've been on holiday, then all of a sudden they've been locked in their cabin for the, you know, the last seven days, and then they've got to Australia and they've had to do 14 days self-isolation again. Um, so some of them haven't seen people in over a month, <laughs> apart from, you know, <laughs> themselves. <laughs> and then you call up. <laughs> and then I call up. <laughs> G'day, mate. How was your holiday? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, and then, and you're doing something else as well, you said. Well, the other thing they've uh, 
got us to do. I haven't done any as yet, but um, uh, delivering care packages to um, people that are uh, in self-isolation as well. There's, you know, a few elderly people that obviously can't get out to the supermarkets or go get their medication or whatever. So they're teeing us up now to... Um, Fill the back of our, I've got a, a ute as a, a company vehicle or a truck, so fill the back of the truck up with packages and go delivering them. Hey, you, well, you use that term ute. That's kind of like the common name for a pickup truck, eh? That's the common name in Australia for a pickup. stands for utility, utility vehicle. Right. But it's kind of one of those things that that's a word that could get lost in a guy with a thick Australian accent. Yeah, I've gone down <laughs> I want to get some shrimp on the water in the ute, and I drove it. Yeah, I can see that one going right past me in a conversation. <laughs> yeah, just chuck her in the back of the ute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you live on the, I'm assuming you have a big house right on the ocean? Uh, no, I have a little house that's about four blocks back from the ocean, three or four blocks back from the ocean. So, So is it pretty quiet on the beaches? Uh, uh, I'd like to say yes, but there's still plenty of people down there um, not doing the social isolation thing. And and so is everybody kind of getting themselves all worked up into a lather or what? Oh, some people are. They've had the police have been down there and cleared the beach a couple of times and they've put up temporary fencing, but people go down there and, oh, look, the fence moves. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and we're on the beach, you know. Are they, what, what kind of luck are they having, Tom, in the in Philadelphia and all that, through that your area? Are they having, um, any, having, having any kind of luck getting people to co cooperate? Or? Well, um, you know, the, the governor started with the order to close all the, the non-essential businesses in, in Philly and some of the surrounding counties. Um, he At first, he asked nicely, and then since nobody listened... Then he asked again a little bit more strongly. And then finally, he implemented a stay-at-home order last week for the five counties around Philly and then also the county around Pittsburgh because that's where the, the outbreaks have been concentrated um, primarily. And now the, the order, the stay-at-home order, is gradually expanding out from there. In fact... We got our, in the county that I live in, we got put under it yesterday as of 8 o'clock yesterday evening. So we heard about it at 2 in the afternoon in the in the, um, the daily governor's news conference. So when I got done working at about 4.30, Deb and I jumped into the car and we proceeded to uh, run over to the Chick-fil-A to get some chicken, <laughs> get some Chick-fil-A for dinner before we were uh, before we were on lockdown. And it was actually a gorgeous day. So after that, we just drove around for about an hour just to, you know, get a little bit of fresh air and sunlight before everything took effect. But long story short, um, it seems to be. It seems to be working, at least in our county, the the you know, in the past 24 hours, there have been no new reported infections. So whereas the day before they had doubled. So, um, you know, still a long ways off from any kind of peak or anything. But people seem to be taking it seriously. You know, we don't see a lot of traffic on the roads or things like that. So I think people are people are by and large doing what they're supposed to do okay so another yeah okay so i i got no problem with that whole i think if we had just self-isolated for three or four weeks and got it over with it would have been a lot faster but that's just me what do i know uh so and then but it, what is that like in australia uh, martin are they is everybody okay there's people on the beaches but generally are people just being a pain in the butt or is, are they trying to play along or no, generally the, everyone's playing along, playing ball, staying at home, only going to the supermarkets, get what you need, get in the car and go home again. Uh, I mean, the roads, you can tell by the roads. It's, I said to uh, Mary yesterday, uh, I was going down the road and I came home and I said, it's like driving on Christmas Day. There's there's no, there's no one out there. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like we've had a week of Christmas days. Um and plus, they've now closed the border between us, uh, Queensland, and um, New South Wales. 
Oh, really? So you can't, yeah, you can't fly between the states uh, here anymore. And um, they've got police uh, roadblocks at the border. Last I heard, there was a four-hour delay to get over the border because um, they're trying to stop all the um, uh, tu uh, tourists or caravanners um, or RV people from coming up from New South Wales because uh, New South Wales has had probably the biggest outbreak in the country because uh, they let a cruise ship off uh, with about 2,500 people on there and, and the day after they let them off the cruise ship, the numbers started doubling every day. Wow. So, um, yeah, I, what, what's today? Today is March 28th, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. Well, with you, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, with you. <laughs> well, it's, it's, this is late at night. This is when we talk to Martin late at night, uh, in, in the Eastern time zone, the, uh, whatever. Is it this, is it Chicago? Yeah, I guess this is around the world. This is just known as the Eastern time zone, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, isn't that, aren't we special? We have our own Eastern time zone. So uh, where we are, Eastern time zone is uh, New York City, Philadelphia, Toronto, Miami, that that corridor, uh, Detroit, which is not in the Midwest. Um, so that's uh, that's the Eastern time zone. So right now for us, it's about 1030 at night on Saturday, March 28th. And it's uh, Sunday, March 29th in Australia. What time is it there? It's half past, uh, 20 past 12 uh, in the afternoon, so just past lunchtime. All right. Have you had lunch yet? Uh, no, I've got to go and have a little look what's inside for lunch. I, I heard some rummaging in the, in the kitchen before, so <laughs> something, must be, something must be on the go. Or... <laughs> all right. So what about train shows? Are they all canceled in Australia? Oh, virtually every train show, every club meeting has been cancelled. Um, we were supposed to have been the first one for the season was last weekend, uh, which was supposed to be up in Bundaberg, which is about five hours north by car from here. And they cancelled that a week out because the uh, government bought the ban in on no meetings of more than 500 people. Um indoors uh, and then they reduced that to a hundred indoors and so um how... basically that that's cancelled the uh, convention of the nmra convention in sydney has been cancelled um virtually every train show there's there's nothing on the schedule till i think about november of next year or this year this, I guess. Th this yeah. year um and then you know if we're still going then that'll be cancelled i guess yeah, because this is your winter season coming up. That's right. Yeah, we're just coming out of summer now and heading into winter. Yeah. So what do you what do you expect? About two, three feet of snow? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, on a photo. <laughs> is there any <laughs> is, a, is there any place in Australia that it snows? Yeah, down, when you go down south, um, the southern part of New South Wales and the northern part of Victoria, um, there's a mountain range there and. It's it's known as the Australian Alpine uh, area. So in winter they'll have snow there and they'll have skiing. Um, it's a place called uh, Threadbow is at least the big ski resort down there. But that's probably about oh I'd say two two and a half days drive in a car from from here. Two and a half so, days. I I hate it when yeah. I'm talking to you because we talk a lot. We 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 know each other really well. And I still feel like a complete doofus when it comes to Australian geography because I can't imagine. So, okay, so Sydney is so, like, how far is it? How long does it take to drive to Sydney? It takes about 10 hours from here to drive to Sydney. So, um, you know, that'd be like, say, you know, driving from Seattle down to L.A., you know, something like that. Wow. And, um, and then, and, and that's, and the, yeah, okay, go ahead. And then um, to drive to Melbourne, you're looking at probably say if you drove from you know Seattle down to Van uh, down to San Diego, that'll be getting down to to Melbourne. I mean it's it's a big country. I mean the country is nearly the same size as the USA, right? Um, yeah. Except we've got 23 million here instead of you know 300 and something million. Right. Yeah. So once you get out of the city, it it goes to you know you get to towns where there's only a 50 to a couple of hundred people that live in there. 
And do you have the same thing like they have here? Like I'm in Canada, Tom's in uh, the United States, and you're in Australia. Wow, this is kind of cool call we got here. Three different, two different continents. Yes, truly and international. It is truly yep. international. Uh, and I'm speaking in Canadian. I actually, I'm speaking. <laughs> I'm speaking in Sudbury. Um, Sudbury is this town about. Uh, I guess it's about uh, three hundred and some odd kilometers or two hundred miles north of Toronto. And it's uh, so ro- it's so rocky and barren. It's uh, where they used to tr- practice with the uh, moon. Ro- the moon. What do they call it? the moon rover, or what do they call their vehicle that they made? The the moon buggy. Yep. Yeah, that's where they would practice with this thing. That's how barren it is, in Sudbury. <laughs> and uh, and they, it's the world's uh, it's the world capital of nickel. That's where they that's where they mine nickel, and there's a giant nickel in the whole thing. So, okay, so you said it takes two and a half hours to get where then? Okay, I see Adelaide on the map. So Okay, so Adelaide, from where we are in Brisbane, you'd probably be looking at two two days drive. Okay. And uh, they have, to get down there. So going, when you get inland, there's no, <clears throat> excuse me, that won't be edited out either. And when you get in. <laughs> When you get inland, then there's no like freeways. It's all like two lane roads, right? <laughs> that that's right. Once 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 you get a hundred k's or 150 k's outside of the um, the uh, major towns or the major cities, the the freeways go to one lane each way, basically. And uh, and yeah, that that. That's it. You, you know, like where we are on the coast, if you left Brisbane, started driving inland, the first major city you'd get to would be Toowoomba. Uh, Toowoomba. And they've got about 130,000 people that live in Toowoomba. And then everything after that, till you, till you basically get to Perth on the other side of the country, you could probably ca- count the population of those towns on one hand. That'd be a heck of a drive too, because there's no real major roads across. Man, how long would it take you to drive across from Brisbane to to uh, Perth, right across through the middle of the country? Well, it's yeah, going through the middle of the country is not really a, a good way. Um, yeah, no kidding. What most people do because because there's not that many, it's all dirt roads and everything out there. So to do it on a sealed highway, yeah, you have to basically go down through Adelaide. Yeah, or the, just north of Adelaide, there's a, a town called Port Augusta um, up there and you go down there and then you can get onto the Nullarbor Plain which is uh, I think it's the longest straight stretch of road in the world and you basically drive around. it's rather funny because when you get onto the Nullarbor Plain they've got a sign there and it's got um, next left hand turn two and a half thousand kilometres away because <laughs> <laughs> it's just straight I mean you know I've heard stories of people that have uh, driven across the Nullarbor and they basically tie the steering wheel up, put a brick on the accelerator and then sit back and relax. <laughs> Cause even if you run off the road, it's just sand. So. Wow. And what's the speed limit? I think the Nullarbor may be unlimited. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Now I think, getting... I'm not sure whether they've put a speed limit on it now or not, but, um, but there's some funny sights you see there. Um, I don't know if you've uh, seen someone's been posting on the internet a picture of a um, uh, a electric vehicle charging station, and it's coupled to a diesel generator. And um, yeah, everyone was having a laugh at that, going, "Oh, you're using a diesel generator to power a yeah. charger for a, for an electric." Well, that's out at the, in one of the service stations out on the Nullarbor Plain. There's there's no electricity out there to to, to power the charger, so the only way you can is by a diesel generator. <laughs> wow which is kind of uh anti uh kind of uh not any point. well What's exactly point? you might as well just buy a, a petrol car <laughs> yeah all right so how many train shows in the winter would normal between now and november how many train shows would you would you go to well our club usually goes to about we usually have about 12 shows 12 to 15 shows a year Holy that we go man. to how come? Uh, uh, how, how come you think? Why do you think model railroading is so popular in Australia? Uh, I don't know. It's. I mean, it's the same way as it's popular in the US. I mean, it's a hobby that encompasses so many aspects. You know, 
uh, technology, electrical, electronics, you know, scenery, artistic stuff, you know. I mean, the yeah. same reasons that, that it's, it's popular out there. What's big out here is Australian modelling. So, you you know, like there's a, we, a lot of Australian prototype modellers, like I model Victorian railways. Um, there's a smattering of English modellers. We've got a couple of uh, European guys in our club. And then after the Australian prototype, the American prototype is probably the the most modelled out here. You know, there's some big uh, big um, American based layouts here. I go for an obsession. Uh, one of my, my mates, uh, Duncan Cabassi, um, he's got a huge uh, N scale uh, double deck layout uh, in a triple car garage, and next to the triple car garage is a double car garage. And that's full of layout as well. And um, he's got this module that he brings out and it clips between the two buildings and hooks the two buildings up. So we have obsessions up there with probably you know, 12 to 15 people wow. attending. You know, so, yeah, they, we, we've got some big layouts in the country like you do in the, U, you know, in the US. Um, and we've also got a lot of small stuff, you know, especially when you get to the European or the British modelers, they, they tend to have smaller layouts and and the likes. Is there many British modelers there? There's quite a few British modelers, being as, uh, you know, the place was founded from the old country. So, yeah, there's there's quite a few British modelers here. There's quite a few European modelers here. Um, there's a couple of guys I know, and uh, all they do is uh, German Deutsche Bahn. Um, um, one of the other, one of the guys in the club, um, all he does is World War Two German ra- uh, railways. So he's got all mm-hmm. the, you know, the the trains full of Messerschmitt 109s on the back and Tiger tanks and and all that kind of stuff. So what's the what's the manufacturer landscape like there for, you know, Australian prototypes or, or other, you know, it, how you know what. How diverse is the manufacturer base for this stuff in in country? Well, for the Australian prototype, we've got there's probably about five manufacturers here. There's Oscision, which is the biggest, um, Austrains, SDR models, IDR models, um, oh, sorry, SDS models. But uh, all the stuff is made in the same factories in China as Atlas, Athern, and all the American prototypes. I mean, okay. it's the same. It's the same. Come, so we get the same quality uh, in our Australian rolling stock and um, and loco, locomotive power as you would by buying, you know, scale trains or you mm-hmm. know any of the the high end um, uh, models over in the the US. The only big difference between Australian models and the American ones is none of the not many of the Australian ones come out with sound in them. So oh, if you buy okay. a sound loco, if you want a sound loco, you're going to have to do it yourself, basically, or get someone to do it for you. Um, the pricing of the lo- of the rolling stock and stuff as well is a lot more expensive than American. Like um, uh, an average cost uh, for a, a loco, like I bought a little a little shunter the other day. It's just been released, uh, a W class shunter, and it's got a, a lock sound version five factory fitted. Uh, but it was four hundred and fifty bucks. All right. For, so, um, so first, I said two words in there that people have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Shunter. What's a shunter? Okay, a switching loco. So for the, ah, okay. the people over in the states, a switching loco. Yeah. So um, over here, they call it shunting. Railway terms in Australia are a mismatch of American and British terms. Like uh, we call them railways, not railroads. Right. Um. Uh, we call uh, we don't call them box cars. We call them uh, lo- vans or, or wagons. Right. So you have w- four wheel wagons oh. or uh, um, we don't have um, gondolas. We have um, open wagons or closed wagons. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's and we don't have uh, cabooses. We have guards vans. Do they still have uh, guards vans? Like in uh, in North America, they're pretty much done away with those. No, they they're done away with over here as well. I I only have them because the era, era I model is 1983 right. in uh, in the state of Victoria, and they still ran guards vans then. You know, did they run, um, did they run cabooses? Uh, no, they, it's really funny. I sent a couple of locos to Ralph to weather, 
right. and he put them on his layout and he hooked them up to a, a um, Canadian Pacific caboose. And it looked ridiculous because the, the caboose was about twice the length of what the loco was. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it, the trains over here are small. Like, it always amazes me when I come to the States and I, you go looking at railroad, the size of the locos over there. They, they're just huge compared to what we have, you know? And, okay, and I'm looking at, like, uh, you know, I'm looking at some photos now <coughs> of Australian railroading. And... uh like where are these local? Where are the, your locomotives made mostly? Nowadays, the locos are generally made by a company called Ganonan Industries in uh, New South Wales, and they're basically copies of American locos. So the modern day locos you see running out here on the coal mines and all that, they'll be SD seventy Aces, or you know, they'll be modern modern era American locos. Some of them are imported already assembled um some are manufactured here under license uh when you get back to the era of thy model um virtually all the all the locomotive power was designed and built in australia uh, off american designs like one of my favorite locos is uh the victorian railways b class loco and it's basically like an f7 but they've just whacked another cab on the other end okay um, because the railways in Australia are not, again, unlike America, where the railways are routes to go from one city to another uh, and then continue on or, or loop around to another city and then come back to their, their point of origin. In Australia, everything is point to point. So at the end of the line, they needed locomotives that they could just uncouple from the train, run around the train and hook it up to the other end and then drag it back into either Sydney or Melbourne or wherever the down part of the line was. So when you look at Australian uh, railways, they're, they're kind of set up totally different to the way American railways run. Um, they're, a, they're a point to point. So they'll, they'll, the train will leave Melbourne and it'll head out to one of the regional cities, uh, stop there, Local will swap ends, and then it'll come back into town again. All right. I'm looking at a picture here, and it's the Emu Bay Railway, or train hauled by nine diesel hyd hydraulic electric locomotives in the, through the rainforest in Tasmania, Australia. So there's rainforest on Tasmania? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in Victoria, there's rainforest down there. And um, when you get up north of, uh, north of Brisbane here, um, We've got rainforest here, but they're more tropical. So, um, yeah. Australia, basically, if you took the east coast of Australia, went 200 miles inland, yeah. it's green and luscious and lovely. As soon as you get over the mountain range, that's when you hit the deserts and you hit the what they call the bush out here, which would be a bit like being in Nevada. Right. Okay. And so, how far is the mountain range from the coast of uh, the uh, east coast of Australia? Oh, uh, probably about a hundred mile. And, okay. So you're like right on the. So it must be pretty picturesque there, eh? Oh yes. A lot. I wouldn't live anywhere else in the world. I've travelled quite a few different places, and yeah, it's just it's lovely here. Okay. And uh, but you're always complaining about how hard it is to get stuff. Oh, not not so much. <laughs> <laughs> all the time, all the time. It's like I, even it, even it even takes uh, it even costs more to get the podcast there. <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we have a lot of fans in Australia. Like a lot of fans in Australia. It's probably the second place or the third place in the in the world where we get downloaded the most. And uh, and and I mean, your guys are always sending. There's uh I think his name's Andy Spencer, I think his name is. He's always in sending in photos yep. of himself wearing a, an AML shirt and stuff like that. Uh we got a ton of fans in Australia. And you you oh. te you're telling me you're always running into people that listen to the podcast. Well, when we go to a train show, if if none of if uh I can get away with it, I'll usually slip an AML t shirt on. Um mm. The, the, usually I'm, I get told off and told to put my club shirt back on. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, but it's all right because I put AML stickers all along the front of the uh, my modules on our club's modular layout now, so people can people can still find us. And I think it was um, 
uh, Redland Bay, I had about three or four, four or five people come up to me during the course of the weekend and said, oh, yeah, we listened to that podcast. And <laughs> How cool yeah. is that? That is very cool. Isn't that cool, Tom? You know. It is. And that's just out in the middle of nowhere, Redland Bay model train show, like a little regional country town show, which maybe had, you know, a thousand people all weekend maybe went through. Yeah. yeah. There were, you know, half a dozen AML listeners in that group. And we had our buddy Rod Deary come all the way over, and you've come over, and I wonder what Rod's doing right now. What are you doing right now? Rod, whatever you're doing right now, take a picture, because this is an Australian show. <laughs> Rod, Rod's probably locked up in self-isolation at the moment, because uh, if you saw his posts, he went over to Bali for a trip with his mates, and um, Bali's a little uh, a resort in Indonesia. Right. Um, so he's had to come back and go into self-isolation, but... I mean, where where he lives, he'd be lucky to have two hundred people that probably live in that town. So right. just by living there is self isolation. I was just going to say his his normal his normal day to day is self isolation. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Cool in Australia, about uh, three hundred two or three and a half hours uh, east of Perth, Australia. Yep. Yeah, he's he's certainly in the wilderness out there, I as know. you can see by the photos. He. He sends in, and and those roads he's grading would be the major roads in the area. I know. I'm. I think I'm going to go back and buy myself like a 2000 uh, Subaru Impreza uh, SRX or whatever, and just so I can go and, and have it shipped to Australia, because those roads just scream high speed. Oh yeah, yep. And yet, and yet, well, didn't you say where you live they have photo radar everywhere? Where we live, well, where we live is on, on the east coast is uh, a bit more sort of uh, populated. So, yeah, we have photo radar. So um, all along the freeway, there are cameras and they've got hidden cameras they put in cars and park on the side of the road. And all of a sudden you get home and the next day you get a nice photo of your car and, a, and it costs you 250 bucks or something. And but that doesn't go against your. Uh, it's it's just the car, right? It's just the owner of the car has to pay. It's not like points against your license or nothing. No, nah, it's points against your license. You lose depending on how quick you were going. Well, how do you? you how do they? Big... How do they prove who is driving the car? Um, well, if it's not you driving the car, you've got to fill out a statutory declaration, send that into them, and then they send it out to the person who was. Oh man! <laughs> yeah. So but, how uh, so that, how many that ca- and random random booze buses are the other things that they have here that you kind of probably don't see in the U.S. Random booze buses. What's a random? Booze? Yep. Okay. Well, they they're a breathalyzer, breath testing for alcohol, right, and drugs. Yeah. And they'll have a bus and uh, probably about twenty police officers, and they'll basically just stop a road. Uh, or the freeway or whatever, and everybody going through has to go through the breathalyzer. Yeah, well, we have that here. We have uh, roadside checks where they'll, you know, just outside of my neighborhood, that's very, it's not that far from a popular night spot. And they'll, you know, you'll cut uh, the main road in and out. They'll have a, a police uh, block and they have roadside, che- they call them roadside checks. And basically yep. you can't get through until you stop and, you know, they stick their head in and see if you've been drinking and stuff, which is you don't want to be drinking and driving anyway. So it's just as well. No, 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 it's it's good. But uh, when I've spoken to a few of uh, my American friends, especially the ones from uh, the southern part of the country, they were saying, no, they couldn't do that here. That's a that's, t- you know, it takes your freedom away or something like that. And I said, well, in Australia, you've got two choices. You either blow in the bag or you <laughs> yeah. go to the police station. <laughs> right. <laughs> What about it? Don't they have the same thing in in the United States? Don't they, Tom? Like they have. Yeah, road- we have. We have. Uh, they call them sobriety checkpoints, where yeah. they, you know, they'll they'll put the cops out. They'll you know they'll screen everybody. They'll make sure you're wearing your seatbelt. If they think you're lit up, they'll pull you out and do um, field sobriety and all that good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, uh, they just he just described. They, we just don't do it in buses. We do it in individual cruisers three or four guys will show up in their cruisers and set up right, a block. right. yeah no they'll here they'll have a, a bus load of of them and they'll pull <laughs> over and yeah it's it's funny yeah uh, yeah man oh man uh, i was just i'm looking at a map here uh, of uh, where rod lives of Coolin, and uh not far from there from a there's a place called 
I don't know. I can't say any of these names. Wongolin, <laughs> Jitarni, <laughs> Jitarni. Anyways, there's a stretch of road, and I'm sure it's dirt, but it's like as straight as an arrow for probably 100 miles. And man, I'd be like, I'd be flying down that road. I, I would move to the back, the outback of Australia, just so I could drive like a madman all the time. Maybe. When you when you look at like the big map of Australia, you have got basically that east coast where people live, sort of from Adelaide, around Melbourne, up to Sydney, Brisbane, up to Townsville at the north, and then on the west coast you've got where Perth, just that bottom corner where Perth is, because the rest of it is just desert. Yeah, it's, you know, it's it looks, like the surface of the moon. It just looks like some of these roads were put in by blind guys or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh, we do we have any other questions tom no no i i'm just uh glad that you know you're managing with all this just like the rest of us and uh you know i like i said i was curious about what the what the manufacturer landscape looks like is is the track gauge the same down there on the prototype as it is here okay well, track gauges in australia are different when you go to different states um oh in Queensland here, uh, the track gauge is three foot six. So our mainline trains all through Queensland are three foot six. When you get over into the border into New South Wales, they're four foot eight. Okay. When you go down over the next border into Victoria, they're four foot eight and five foot three and a half. When you go to Adelaide in South Australia, they're four foot eight, five foot three, and three foot six. Tundra, Jesus! You think it's wow? Uh, you think it's now? You've got to think back to Australia's history. Australia was basically these states were separate countries, so they all went off on their own to um, to uh, build a rail network. That's why the rail networks basically go from the capital cities out into the state to bring produce and things back to the capital to to sell on to other people or to the coast so they can ship them. Right. So when the first railways in Australia started, Victoria was the first one to put a rail system in, and they had a guy come out, an engineer from the Great Western Railway with Brunel. And, of course, being a purveyor of the wider the gauge, the better, they put the five-foot, three-and-a-half-inch gauge in. Mm -hmm. The next most popular state, New South Wales, at the time said, yes, we'll do the same thing so we can match them up. Uh, but they had a change of government. And they employed an LNER uh, engineer, an Irishman, uh, to come over, and he made him four foot eight. So basically, up until probably the early 80s, when you used to catch a train from Melbourne to Sydney, which are the two main um, capital cities in the country, when you got to Albury at about th on the border at about one o'clock in the morning, you don't get woken up and have to get off the train, walk across the platform and get on another train that would then take you into Sydney that was four foot eight. And eventually they, um, they made um, a bogey exchange program where they used to actually change all the bogies underneath the train as it would come through uh, and put, uh, go from five foot three uh, to four foot eight. Um, now there's a four foot eight track that goes up the whole east coast of Australia, but that probably never went in until the 1990s. Mm -hmm. So, so it's again when you look at the size of the country and the population we have, it's very expensive to build the infrastructure. Right. So we don't have anything like you know like like in the US. Uh, the easiest and cheapest way to ship stuff in Australia is to put it on a boat and ship it up the coast and and pull it off again rather than to build a rail line up through the country. Um, and so that's what that happened over the, over time. And uh, right. Queensland being such a big state, they couldn't afford to build four foot eight gauge. So they went um, three foot six. So all the main rail is three foot six in Queensland, which is funny because on the Gold Coast here now, they've just built a new light rail system. And the last extension they did on it, they joined the light rail up to one of the heavy rail uh, train stations, so it could walk up to the uh, the network to get up to Brisbane. Huh. <laughs> the, the the light rail system is four foot eight, and the heavy rail system is three foot six. <laughs> <It's> kind of counter <laughs> counterintuitive. 
Yeah, it kind of doesn't make sense, you know. That's kind of like uh, kind of a, a certain kind of backwards. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah, so it's very eclectic. I've I've actually done a, a for um, St. Louis this year. I actually had a clinic together on the eclectic railways of Australia and just going through all the different gauges in each state um, and uh, and how they they came to be like that. You know, and it's basically just costs. Um, you know, the country doesn't have the population to support. You know the uh, the uh, infrastructure building that was required, so they've had to make do. Wow! So, are you looking forward to St. Louis, the NMRA convention in St. Louis? Oh, look, I'm I'd, I'm dying to get to St. Louis, but <laughs> the problem is that I don't think they'll let me out of the country because at the moment we're in complete shutdown all overseas. They had a travel advice saying not to travel overseas. And about a week and a half ago, they brought in a ban. Um, so they, you're actually banned from leaving the country. So until that ban's lifted, I may, you know, whether they have the convention in St. Louis or not, I may not be able to get out of the country because there's no flights or anything going out of Australia now. Qantas has shut down virtually all their international flights bar the one to London. And I think that finishes tonight. That's the last flight. Um, Virgin Australia have stopped all um, all flights um, overseas, and both the, all the domestic uh, um, airlines have reduced their capacity by ninety percent. So you can't fly to Sydney from Brisbane anymore because there's a the borders locked down. Um, yeah, so it's getting very hard to move around here. Uh, and if they don't, Qantas don't start flying again, it's a long way in a rowboat to get from Australia to uh, <laughs> the West Coast of America. <laughs> so uh, you're basically, you're stranded on an island. Yeah, a big island. <laughs> an island that it'd take you four days to drive across. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what's going to happen with um, St. Louis. As I said, it's... It's not so much whether they cancel the convention or anything, but at the moment, no one can get out of here. And there's about four or five of us from Brisbane that were coming over to the convention. Um, so we, we actually had a chat last night online um, about, you know, what are we going to do? Is, uh, you know, do, is, do you think this is going to happen? And knowing the Australian government, I can, until they find a vaccine for this thing, I can see them banning all overseas travel until they do, which yeah. could be next year. Really, eh? I think it'll go that long. Eh? I must be pretty. I think I'm. Tom, do you think I, I think I might be pretty naive about this whole thing? Do you think? In in what way? Uh, pick a way. <laughs> pick any pick any part of the topic because I'm thinking to myself, <clears throat> I'm can, uh, travel between Canada and the United States is like uh, it's it's like uh, going to the convenience store. It's Canada. It's like going to Wisconsin. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I have trouble believing <laughs> it. I have trouble believing it'll be that long before they'll go, oh, well, they're just Canadians. Have at it. <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it's all really going to depend on the arc that the oh, I'm not... infections and every, and I don't want to get, oh, I don't want to have that I debate, don't but... want to get you started on that. No, 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 no. But really, I mean, that, that's really what's gonna, that's really what's going to dictate what, what the, what the spread looks like, what they do with travel. Yeah, you I know? know, I mean, that's, there, there's no way to tell at this point. I mean, that, that's just there, there's, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to, you know, that this, you know, self-quarantining and everything is going to work and we'll be out of this sooner rather than later. But there's, you know, there's no way to tell at this moment. I shouldn't have said nothing, Martin. That's my fault. <laughs> hey, you know what? If you want some really good information about all this that's going on, there's a, um, a doctor out here, Dr. Norman Swan, who's part of the um, ABC or the, the, um, or the, the government-owned um, broadcaster, which is paid by the public, um, the, he 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 runs a um, daily podcast oh, called yeah. Corona called Corona Cast, um, and 
Yeah, he's the most straight shooting person I've ever heard on any medical matters. Whenever, when anything ever tends to happen in Australia, everybody looks to him as to, okay, what should we be doing? You know, uh, and he's, uh, he's he's no nonsense. He'll he'll you know he'll paint the the picture like he was talking about the other day about the uh, curve. You know, like we're all isolating everything to flatten the curve, and people are thinking it's going to reduce fatalities. And he said, all it's doing is it's going to delay fatalities right okay. and it'll allow um and it'll allow our medical resources to be able to treat the people as they come in all right now um, you, you now you guys are just being downers okay you just, no, 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 it's, no it's 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 the exact same thing my son the phd virologist said it's better to have it's better to have a a, a longer slower lesser burn than it is to have a short quick hot burn because of yep. the limits of the healthcare system. All right. Look, All right. You push me far I, enough. I, you push me far <laughs> enough. You know what I'm going to say next, Tom? Uh, it's probably going to be something about the 16 year old flipping burgers at McDonald's. Well, that's, it's either that. Yep. Well, actually I've come up with what's really going to drive me nuts when I'm going to really lose my crap. But the, the thing I was going to say is the month of March, there's 31 days in the month of March. On average, 102 people are killed in cars every day. 3,200 mm-hmm. people will be killed in the month of March, and th- tens of thousands of others will be injured. And it's kind of like there's all kinds of stuff going on. So there you go. There's a, That's my thing. But here, forget that. Um, and it's more dangerous to drive your car. than You're more likely to get killed in your car oh, than to get COVID. I agree. You can get run over by a bus sooner, probably. Um, but you know what's really going to drive – I would I, when, I, when I'm not on the air, I say – this is what's really going to make me lose my, and uh, in two and a half two and a half years, I'm telling you, I'm going to completely go bo- uh, bonkers. I'm going to go completely bonkers in two and a half years because this is what's going to drive me nuts. People posted memories on Facebook. Yep. <laughs> of of here we here we are. Here's a memory of us. We're all gathered around playing Monopoly back when they're put Oh, my God. Yeah, I got it. Back uh, two and a half years ago, just like the rest of us, you were self-isolated eating potato chips. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Although, you, you must admit, the self-isolation part has brought out – I've I've seen some really cool um, uh, videos put out by musos who have rewritten the lyrics to uh, to famous songs and then recorded them again. Uh, uh, you know, uh, online. I mean, <laughs> there's some talented people out oh, there who yeah. have a lot of time on their hands, and it's very entertaining. It is. It's very. It's very. It's it's a it's a great study into the human, into the human experience. So if you look at it that way, you know, it's like I used to say when I used to when I when I went through my thing, my cancer thing. It's like at the after about a year, I was thinking to myself, this is an unbelievably fascinating experience. And if you look at it that way, that's uh, there's yeah. lots to be learned. Uh, but you know what? We don't want to. Me- I haven't mentioned yet, and I think it's important to mention. I know there's lots of others of you out there, uh, but uh, so please let us know who you are. But I can think of three people: uh, little Mike Wachowski, who yep. may or who may or may not be uh, someday be uh, super fan number thirty one, I believe. Uh, 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 Adam Pinellas, who's a conductor on Amtrak, who's out there out amongst the people uh, trying to figure out what to do. We have Tracy Boyd, who's still flying with Southwest because lots of uh, y- younger people, uh, younger flight attendants with kids, you know, are, are afraid to. Get, so she's taking the, taking the, the on the taking whatever I am. What is she taking? She's taking, she's taking responsibility and trying to help out and and help other people. And, you know, we got uh, George Taylor and another fellow that works for FedEx. There are a lot of people that are really uh, doing uh, yeoman's work that should be uh, recognized. Exactly. Yeah. So anyways, there you go. Tom, have I made you mad because you seem to quiet up? No, not at all. Okay. Letting you (laughs) you talk. (laughs) I'm telling you. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, well, don't stop being polite. Will you stop being polite on the podcast? It doesn't fit this podcast. <laughs> well, not with Captain Grumble, bum anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm telling you, in two and a half years, when people start posting memories, 
I'm going to go absolutely bonkers. It's like, <laughs> I, I, I hate memories now. I have one friend that constantly posts memories and I'm thinking, I have no interest in what you were doing 10 years ago. Like, I'm glad you're happy. I'm glad you got the photo on your computer. I'm glad you can look at it, but I'm not interested in what you were doing 10 years ago. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, see, I, I like, I mean, I enjoy for myself seeing those, like when they pop up on my phone or whatever, but I don't ever like share them with everybody else. It's like, you've already seen that. That's you a saw it. Yeah. You saw it five years ago, right? Yeah. You know, but, but I do, you know, sometimes it is, especially like before I started the Facebook page for the, for the layout, when I was just posting all my updates and work session pictures and everything, when I was just posting them on my personal page. So now and again, one of those will pop up, you know, like all the pictures from, you know, a day in the barn, like in 2015 or sure, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's kind of cool to see like, Oh, it looks so different now. And, you know, we were so, we're so much further along and on and on, but I'm not like, bombarding the the viewing public with all that crap i agree with you 100 percent. i enjoy seeing my own personal memories when they come up yep. uh, i enjoy that very much to see them on my phone or wherever i am at looking at facebook and you see these memories come up I'm like oh yeah right and you know, you know and yeah i might even forward the picture to that particular person and have a private conversation with them about that memory but i don't want to see that five years ago you were at the grand canyon I don't care. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to see it. Five years ago, you traveled to to the, you traveled to Peru. I don't care. That was five years ago. Stop. <laughs> right. What I hate about the memories is uh, you started a Facebook page up on the layout, and all of a sudden you get a memory from three years ago, and the layout looks exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> now that's funny. That's funny. See, now I've had that rant, and now I can't edit it out because I'm promising myself I won't edit any of this. Oh, no, oh, you great. shouldn't. Oh, great. Now everybody thinks I'm crazy. Well, lots of people thought that. <laughs> well, no, you... no, we've, we've got videos to prove other people are crazy. <laughs> um, you better tell everybody who you're talking about when you're talking about Captain Grumblebum because you and I and only a few other people know who you're referring to when you say that. Well, it's it's uh, y yourself I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, when when he when he has a little rant or goes off on a, <laughs> a tangent, or, you know, it just it's, it's Captain Grumblebum is off again. <laughs> I actually kind of I actually that name kind I kind I kind of like that name. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of cute. I, I do cute really well. Yeah, well, it's not meant to. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be endearing. It's not meant to be in. Oh, you know, absolutely! Uh, I've never taken. Like you know what? I've never taken anything you said to me as an insult, and I understand it's all in good fun. And we might as well get right to the chase. I don't pay attention to anything you say anyways. Well, there you go. See, you treated <laughs> with the ignorance I deserve. <laughs> all right. Uh, hey, Tom, you want to give out the email address? Sure. Um, <laughs> or not? <laughs> no, I can. I can. I just got to I just gotta think of my ones, one L's and two L's. Um, can I stop you? Can I stop you? Sure. Uh, uh, have you, if you've ever noticed Bruce, the moderately agitated male boy never says anything about one L and two L's. He just gives it, he just gives it like his, uh, you know, it's like he's, uh, taken off on the Apollo, Apollo 11 mission. And it's like, he's very businesslike. So I don't think that's, yeah, but, but, he, but he sets the bar too low. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so if you would like to contact us through the modern medium of electronic mail, you can write to us at modelerslife at gmail.com. That's modelers with one L, as in Australia, <laughs> not two L's, as in Lionel. Wow, I like that. Nice one. Well done. Um, how do you spell uh, modelers in Australia? One L or two L's? Uh... Uh, Martin. One one L one L in Australia. Okay, and is it M is it M A, M -A R T I N? Oh, oh, sorry, no. I thought you meant how many L's are in a, in the word Australia. No, no. Modelers <laughs> here is modelers here is with two L's. Yeah, try to keep up, will you? 
yeah. <laughs> and it's actually it's another thing that's funny about Australia is some people will spell and write American, and the majority will spell the old English way. So yeah, when you get a few, sometimes when you get on someone's computer, all of a sudden red lines appear under everything as spelling errors when, you know, mm. they're set to, to be English American, not English English. Right. Like like color with a U and uh, yeah, honor, honor and valor. Honor with a U. Yeah, I yeah. would I would say that's kind of where I'm at now because I have so many American friends. I have so many friends now all over the world because of the podcast. But I have so many American friends. I'll be writing something and I'm thinking. No, I won't use the U this time. I'll go without the U. So, like, I'm constantly wa- going waffling between using the U and not using it. Or you could just be a bad speller and you're using that as a cover. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, except spell check. Oh, my God. If you don't use spell check, but that's another story. Um, I was going to, oh, yeah, I'm going to tell a, tell a, an endearing little story about our buddy Tony Cook when you were saying about people using two la- writing in two languages. Uh, Tony Cook, who's a close friend of mine and a close friend of everybody on the AML network, the editor of Model yep. Railroad News. Um, one thing that he does with me, because we have a lot of conversations via text and messenger, is he'll send me a text, blah, blah, blah. And we'll be having a conversation in text. And all of a sudden I start getting it in messenger. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm talking in two different languages, right? I'll be ta- We'll be talking away. And on texting, and then all of a sudden it goes to Messenger, and then we start talking away on Messenger, and then it goes back to texting. So it's kind of cute. It's very cute. <laughs> when I think Tony, I must I, say though, t- Tony has the voice for radio. Oh my god! Does he, he, yeah, he does. He ever he has he has the perfect voice for radio. Some yep. someday when the tight when the when I get swept away in the tsunami, you can you can know he's just going to sweep in and take over and be like. The dulcet tones of Tony Cook. Actually, <laughs> the late mm. night dulcet tones of Tony Cook. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, though, Tom, you've got a great. You got you now. You've got your voice is. You must notice it when you're listening to the podcast. How good you sound. <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, not. Oh, really? I'm more. I'm more like. Oh, I can't believe I said that. Well, not not. <laughs> I didn't say how how whether. <laughs> <laughs> the content. I, I, right, I right. didn't say anything about your intelligence. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, pre- I appreciate that. Yeah. It's all going to come down. I'm telling you, it's all going to come down to the memories in, in about two and a half, three years. It's gonna yeah. Be- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that could be the end of civilization. And then, and then we'll be, we'll be on, we'll be on hug it out 232. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> exactly and i'll be ranting away you know by then we'll be like closing it. i think by the time we get to 10 years it'll just be you know it'd be the howard stern show of model railroading <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating i've been everybody i've been getting so many positive uh comments about doing this during this uh, mess for people to listen to but i mean uh somebody was writing to me today about uh, how much this truly has become like a little nation. The AML nation has become a little nation. And yet we, you know, we were talking about railroads today, but we talk about it just like going to a club or just like being friends. It's the, it's the best. I can't, I can't believe I came up with this idea. Uh, all because I wanted to hear the sound of my own voice. <laughs> and now the whole world can. Yeah, there you go. All right. So uh, uh, we have a website too, modelerslife.com. Uh, go there and you'll see all kinds of stuff. And if you like this, when this is all over, join Patreon too, because when this is all over, we'll be back to twice a week. And if you want to hear it more than once a week, uh, join up on Patreon. It's only five bucks a month and you'll get uh, uh, two podcasts a week. Uh, you'll get the more serious side of the AML, if there is such a thing. And then you'll get the uh, what uh, uh, Kaylee Zhang uh, calls the antics channel. <laughs> AML AML two the antics channel. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Uh, are you ready, Martin? Oh, I'm ready. Okay. So remember, remember, a modeler's life podcast is considered marginally adequate by six out of ten Australian lifeguards.
Island Busted Knuckle, guests of a Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol, Motorcourt and Inn, where a late night dancing at the Rumber Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer.